the show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's May 31st, 2022. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Canesport.com, joined as always by our well-rested managing editor, Matt Shodell, who had a great Memorial Day weekend. And we are here to discuss the news of the day, presented as always by Life Wallet. Well, the time is now to take charge of your personal health. And uh, Matt, I hope you had a good Memorial Day weekend. Hope you took charge of your personal health. Got a little R&R in. Um, won't reveal where you've been. You know, that's your personal business. But I will say it's near mountains somewhere. So I was, look, I was hanging out with Carol. So uh, I was hanging out with Carol Sofer. That's the truth. <laughs> I'm still yeah. on the road. I'm still on the road. I'll be, I'll be back later today. Um, you can tell by the painting behind me. That's why the horse is missing. I like that way better than the horse. Can you bring that home with you? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the news of the day is uh, plentiful today because um, we've had a whole uh, weekend of stockpiling it and stuff. And um, there was no laying out by the beach for Mario Cristobal and the coaching staff. A lot of recruiting continuing to go on. Um, we'll get to that here in, in a moment, Matt. But first, I want to touch on the baseball program, which, uh, man, we've been talking about it for weeks. They've been kind of reeling a little bit. Uh, they lost their mojo. They, they were one of the hottest teams in the country earlier in the year. Uh, been a lot of hot and cold stretches here in the last month or so. Um, Notre Dame series at the end of the season looked like they were turning it around a little bit. Then they go to the ACC tournament and go over and lose their two games in the ACC tournament. Um, not a good look going into the regionals, but they did uh, get awarded a host site for the first round. Uh, it will be at Mark Light Stadium. And um, Matt, you have did a deep dive into the teams that are going to be coming down here to, to play in, in that regional. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Give us a quick rundown, your viewpoint on uh, this week's regional. Uh, Miami should advance from the regional fairly easily. <laughs> oh, you want more than that? I was, yeah. I was confused. Yeah, I think we want they're, more. Than that. Yeah. They're also, they're also, listen, the NCAA somehow likes Miami now. I don't know. It's the first time I can remember for, and forever where you don't, as a, if you're a Miami fan, you don't feel slighted for some reason. Like they, they probably should not have been a top eight seed. They're, they're guaranteed obviously a regional host berth. And if they win, they're guaranteed a super regional host berth, even though they lost four of the last six games and they gave the NCAA selection committee every reason not to make them a top eight seed. I mean, they probably should have been a nine or 10 seed based on sort of how they ended the season. Yeah. They won the most games of any ACC team, but the NCAA had an excuse built in from Miami. I mean, you hear the names Arizona and Mississippi State. I'm sorry, not Mississippi State. You hear the names Arizona and Mississippi, and you think, oh man, you know those are those are powerful programs, and it's going to be tough. But but neither of them have been particularly good this year. Uh, Arizona 37 and 23, Mississippi 32 and 22, respectively the two and three seeds. Uh, both teams have issues. You know, Arizona sort of thrives on its hitting and its bullpen. Um, they have not great starting pitching at all. Uh, Mississippi, um, you know, is sort of uh, up and down with everything, honestly. You know, they, they sort of have power hitters, not as great batting average, no real, like their, their top three starters in the final series are basically were part-time starters this year. You know, uh, one of them eight starts and 17 appearances, the other eight and 16 appearances, and the final one, who's their number three guy, 13 starts and 15 appearances. Um, you know, the closers one and three, four point three eight ERA with nine saves. So there there are some issues there. And then the number four seed is obviously going to advance because their name is Canisius Canisius, and their and their nickname is the Golden Griffin. So I don't see how Miami has a chance against them in the game one, but maybe a miracle will happen and they'll pull it out. So um we put our uh resident baseball expert Jim Martz onto the baseball case. Um and he went down to the announcement and got to speak a lot uh, to Gino Damari about the ups and downs. And it's kind of interesting because it's like nobody's overreacting to anything. Like, you know, they're very analytical about what's happened this year. You know, they still walk 
through the same door and Omaha is on the sign above the door as, as a symbol of, of the only acceptable goal in Miami baseball, to try to get to the College World Series. And um, the NCAA committee, to their credit, took a look at the entire body of work and didn't overreact to what's been going on here in the later stages of the season. And that is what they are supposed to do, Matt. Um, a season is a full body of work. What happens in the first month of the season is just as important as what happens in the last month of the season. And um, that's, that's, not true. that's not true in football, is it? No, not, no, no, it's really not. And so I'm not sure it should be the case in baseball, but that's yeah, how they treated I, Miami, so that's good for Miami. Yeah, it worked out for Miami. I don't know that it's the way Matt Shodell describes it as the NCAA likes Miami. I love Miami. I've never, ever gotten the impression that they love Miami. They, well, they could have screwed Miami. But, they didn't. But in this case, it's correct. They could have screwed Miami. They had every reason to screw Miami. They didn't screw Miami. So baseball regional this weekend. Uh, we'll see how it goes from here. All right. Um, a ton of, of, of recruiting uh, coverage to talk about on the website today. But um, so that we don't have to interrupt it, uh, let's take a moment now to hear from our friends at Life Wallet. I will be your shield in the fiercest battle I'll defend you. Yeah. Oh, it's hey, my name is Cleveland Reed and I play offensive line and my job is to protect. I protect my family with Life Wallet. How about you? Of course I got Life Wallet. It's the best way to protect my family. Long as we go together, we'll die, we'll never be a light. Couldn't let the darkness try you ever. Truth in my word, you I lied to never. To protect you and your family, get Life Wallet now. Life Wallet. Saving time, saving lives. Were you protecting your Life Wallet uh, up there in the mountains? Uh, Memorial Day weekend, did, did, did you have all your medical information programmed into your app and, um, you know, tr travel with everybody well protected and safe? Well, what do you take a guess? You <laughs> I'm at the age where, like, if I go, I go, man. You know, it's OK. I I've, I've enjoyed myself. I've enjoyed covering the hurricanes, everybody. I did have to take a COVID test. It was negative uh, because my, my sister-in-law... Um, was diagnosed, well, I guess had a positive test and we were around her, um, which, you know, for all you out there, let that be a lesson. Don't hang out with your in-laws. It's, it's not worth it for numerous reasons. <laughs> all right, let's, um, let's dive into some of these recruiting stories that are on the website um, this morning. Uh, quite a few of them. Um, so the one that, that really um, interests me quite a bit is the, the personal attention that Ruben Bain, the, the, the defensive end from Miami Central, is getting from Mario Cristobal. And it's really weird. This has been a like bizarre recruitment. I would have bet that Ruben Bain would have been one of the first commits. And maybe he's a silent commit. You know, I don't know. But if he's a silent commit, he's doing a darn good job of selling that he's not a, a silent commit because he is going all over the place, Matt. And um, it looks like it's going to be a little while before he announces. Yeah, I just like how Ruben says that <clears throat> Mario's a, quote, up all night type of guy. <laughs> well, we already knew that. From Mario, yeah. 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., you know, Mario's on call for Ruben Bain and various other recruits. It is pretty amazing and, and refreshing to, to see a head coach that personally recruits pretty much all the top prospects and even some of the guys that aren't, quote, unquote, top prospects. Um, you know, we're going to see if it pays off. NIL throws a wrench into, like I said, NIL's not doing Miami any favors. I know the, the whole thing with Ruiz is, is great for the program, great for the players, but it also negates traditional recruiting. And Mario Cristobal is such a great traditional recruiter, so it's sort of like a, a positive and a negative. Everyone knows I'm a negative person, but I'm telling you, it's, it's a balance. It's a balance. It, it, NIL negates a little bit of what Mario's magic is. Um, and at the same time, right now, I think it's helping Miami, but we'll see if that continues. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I think we talked about this on another show. I mean, from my viewpoint, I'm a little concerned about this world of NIL negating the better recruiters like Mario Cristobal because so many of these kids, from what I can see, 
all about the Benjamins, man. It's like, you know, they're you all about how much, you can't, you can't blame them. They, there's no guarantee of the NFL future. And in fact, a very low percentage, even from the top programs, make it to their second contract in the NFL, which is where the real money is, unless you're a first or even a second rounder. I mean, I get it, Matt, but like, isn't that really where the real money is? And and doesn't how doesn't where you are and who you get developed by and those sort of things matter still matter even in the world of, of NIL? I mean, if one school's offering you say a fifty thousand dollar NIL deal, and technically they're not really even supposed to offer anything until you're already committed to the school and are going to go there. But but um, I mean, we all know that the reality of it is is that these kids know what their NIL deals are going to be while they're being recruited, or at least. Yeah, if you guys out there think agents already don't have their hooks in these recruits talking to them. Oh, 100%. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. They're, yeah. they're going to drive, they're eventually going to figure out how to drive recruits to specific programs. There'll be programs that give kickbacks to agents for getting kids to their programs. It's just no going to be the new normal, just like the bag man. It'll be, you know, the agent who's got his handout to the program under the table and then directs his player. Hey, they're going to give you this, go there. You know, They'll, they got a guy who's going to give you this deal. It, it's just not right. The NCAA freaked out because they were getting sued and they were going to lose and the and Congress wouldn't help them out. Like They're just like, screw it. Let's let the agents run everything. And that's what's happening. And I don't know that there's a way out now. I, I think if they do remove the one-time transfer rule, it's a step, step in the right and the wrong direction. Step in the wrong direction for the kids, but a step in the right direction to prevent kids from going to the highest bidder every single year they're in college. I don't think there's an answer right now. It's putting a salary cap like some people talk about. It's ridiculous. It's a free market. That'll, they'll be sued for that too. I don't. I, I think the NCAA's hands are tied. I don't think there's going to be any legislation about it um, at the governmental level. I don't think the NCAA is going to be able to really. You know, there's going to be a way around anything they try to do, in my opinion, with with, with this now being NIL being legal. Yeah, but you know, like the thing is, like the. The, to me, the smarter kids and the ones that are the best guided are going to understand it's not just about putting yourself out to the highest bidder coming out of high school that, you know, you want to pay more attention to the details uh, in terms of what's best for your development and where you're going to get the best training and everything else. Uh, but there are probably I, I don't want to I don't have a real stat. I can't say it's the majority of kids, but in our coverage of recruiting, we are seeing a lot of kids out there that clearly are just looking for the highest bidder and um, it's troublesome. And I, I think it's, it's making it a little bit more difficult um, for Mario Cristobal and his staff that aren't really about that. Like they're, they're, they're not sitting here looking to get into bidding wars with everybody, um, you know, and for, you know, for, for, you know, right or wrong or indifferent, it, it doesn't really matter right now. And I, you know, I, I certainly, can't sit here and say that you should go and take a kid, let's say a quarterback, and, and guarantee him three, four, five million dollars before he's even participated in a practice on campus. Um, and Tennessee did that with Nico, uh, I'm a Maleva, and um, it's kind of screwed up quarterback recruiting for sure. But um, teams are maybe being a little bit more disciplined at other positions. And I think. The NCAA, when they took that little deep dive a few weeks ago into NIL, I think that kind of spooked people a little bit. And I think uh, I, I think I've seen a little bit of a mellowing out in NIL the last few weeks, while people try to figure out how they're going to navigate through what might be coming in the future, what the rules really are, how closely they're being watched, and all those kind of things. And um, I think it's all a factor. But anyway, getting back to what we were saying about Reuben Bain. So I'm just kind of surprised, Matt, that he look, he seems uh, so far from from committing. I mean, like you know, not even close. I mean, I still think he's going to be a Miami Hurricane. If I had to make, yeah, a I, bet, I, I agree. I agree, hundred percent. If I had to make a bet right now, it would be that he would be a Miami Hurricane. His brother is on the staff. His uncle Tolbert played for the Canes. His whole life has been about the Canes. Um, yet on June third. He's going to Oklahoma on June 10th. He's going to Auburn. And on June 24th, he's going to Alabama. Um, Miami will get one of his official visits. Um, just no uh, definition on when that's going to be. So um, it's going to be fun. I mean, he's going to some pretty sexy places. It's going to be fun following Ruben's recruitment here in the last few months or so of recruiting in this cycle. 
Um, but it has not gone how I would have predicted it would go, Matt. Um, I, if you had asked me back in January, I would have thought that Ruben Bain would have been one of the first to commit in this class. If he waits to announce an all-star game or on signing day, which I think he is probably planning to do, then it's good he's taking these visits elsewhere in June because they'll all have long worn off. And if he wants to go back there, hypothetically, he has to pay his own way um, in the fall. And he has a season in the fall. And the early signing day helps Miami with local kids because there's no January visits right before signing day. Kids are in season if they're on a good team right until the December signing day. Um, that's a factor that helps Miami a lot. All right, another guy that's getting personally recruited by Mario Cristobal that Miami clearly wants very badly is offensive lineman um, uh, Madden Sanker from uh, from Georgia. And um, very impressive-looking prospect. We bring you an update on him today. And um, he, he's got an official visit set um, in June and is very much a priority in this class. Um Derek LeBlanc, uh, defensive lineman from Kissimmee Osceola, uh, was back on campus yet again this week. And this time, instead of bringing uh, um, a teammate um, John Walker, um, he brought um, Dakari Jackson, another uh, a teammate of his. And um, now uh, Jackson is very much in, um, in a much uh, higher, uh, more significant picture with Miami coming off that visit. So we've got stories on all of that on the website for you to sink your teeth into. Um, we also catch up with in-state safety, uh, Kylan Webb. Um, he landed a cane offer after being evaluated this spring and he shares with us uh, just where he fits in his thought process right now. Um, interesting story with St. Thomas Aquinas quarterback Tyler Aronson. And uh, quite frankly, we're not sure he's 2024 kid. We're not sure yet where he's going to stand in 2024. Um, but he's such an interesting story. He's a nice kid. And, you know, you'll remember he, he was going to school in Palm Beach Gardens. And he drives from Palm Beach Gardens down to St. Thomas Aquinas in Fort Lauderdale every day to go to school. He will be St. Thomas' quarterback this year. Um, he loves Miami. No secret about that. Um, so we catch up with uh, Tyler Aronson. Um, Alex Mirabal, the offensive line coach, has offered a four-star Missouri standout who plans to, to, to visit. And his name is Williams uh, Nwaniri, I believe is the correct pronunciation um, of that one. Um, Miami was his 19th offer. And um, he breaks down for us where the Canes stand. We talked to four-star tight end Tavian Galloway who's recently been offered by Steve Field. Uh, he says Miami's kind of like his dream school. And um, he grew up with a dad in the house that rooted for the Canes all through his childhood. Um, how does that affect him? We bring you an update on that in the story today. And then we also talked to uh, receiver Lamar Seymour, Miami Central. You'll remember he was a very early commitment in this cycle. The old coaching staff offered him. He, um, he committed uh, with the quality of receivers in this class. I personally am not sure that Lamar Seymour is going to stick in this class by the time we get to December, um, but he's covering his bases and um, is visiting other places and things like that. But we talked to him a little bit from a different point of view of where he sees this Miami program going in the future. So, um, Matt, to sum it all up, a lot of recruiting coverage, a lot of different angles, a lot of interesting stories. Um, the beat goes on from Mario Cristobal and staff. Uh, but now June is approaching. We're a day away from June, and there's going to be a ton of official visits and unofficial visits this month. Uh, i got to believe that some of these recruitments start to land in the commitment category. Yeah, uh, we'll see. It's, it's... It's so hard to tell sometimes with these recruits um, when they actually will announce. Some of, them have, some of them have said before the season. So now does that mean June or July or August? Um, you know, it's going to be very interesting. I, I do think Miami should come away probably before the season, before the high school season begins. I would have to think five to ten commits will come on board. I'd be shocked if, if there's not at least that amount. Um, they've been putting in so much work and effort. Uh, and, and they do want commitments. It's not that they're saying, hey, everybody, wait till signing day. 
Uh, but they just want kids to be sure, and they're not really pushing, for the most part, other than a quarterback here or there, to say, hey, you know, we need to know. So, um, so it's going to be really a really interesting June. Um, you know, everyone's going to have to pay very close attention to what's said and what's not said in some of our interviews uh, throughout the next month. A very interesting June indeed upon us, um, and uh, we'll have some big announcements of our own in the month of June that I think people are going to find interesting, um, exciting times for canesport.com, and um, been working hard on uh, on some different things that we'll be doing in the future, and um, pretty soon we'll be able to start telling you guys about those as well. Uh, so that's going to do it for today for Good Morning Canesport. For Matt Shodell. I'm Gary Furman. We thank you for joining us once again and starting your day with us. Uh, Matt Shodell, have a nice uh, trip home this morning. Please, please, please find some way. I, man, that, that's big, though, man. I don't know if you're going to be able to fit that picture on, <laughs> on the plane, but but uh, maybe you could ship it or something. I well, like you, it you much can't better see, than the horses. You can't see the whole picture, but there's actually – oh, wrong way. There's actually a horse right there. You just can't see it. <laughs> All right, well, um, I don't know. Find a way to get it home. If not, I still got that other picture that was painted by one of our subscribers that I think is a phenomenal piece of work. I still got that you know, teed up for you. Happy to um, tra transfer it over to your house at any time as well. All right, so for Metrodome, I'm Gary Furman. Thank you for joining us today on Good Morning Canesport. We'll see you next time, everybody.